Good morning, Glasgow, and good afternoon, New Zealand. Welcome to this important event demonstrating the very best of climate disclosure, disclosure leadership from across the world. My name is Mardi McBrien. I'm the Managing Director at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, and we're delighted to be hosting this event today with the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures has been shifting the needle globally on climate risk and opportunity reporting to capital markets for well over six years now, with the re recommendations forming an important part of a global baseline for companies and financial sector to report against. The TCFD, or as I said, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, has been adopted in a number of different ways across the world. And I'm delighted to have with us today the perfect panel of experts and leaders who have taken the ambitious step to mandate private sector climate risk disclosure. So to kick us off this morning, I would like to welcome New Zealand's Minister for Climate Change, the Honourable James Shaw, to talk about their experience making TCFD mandatory. And congratulations for doing it. Well done. Well, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa, ngā mihi nui kia koutou. Good morning. Uh, I just want to extend a, a particular welcome to those of you who are uh, on the other end of our television pipes. Um, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's, it's good to have you with us. Um, so six years ago uh, in Paris, as the talks were going on, I was a, a opposition MP uh, and I was uh, a guest of our government uh, at, at those talks, but of course I wasn't involved in the negotiations. Uh, so I spent quite a lot of time going to different side events uh, and kind of exploring what was on offer. Uh, and uh, one of the side events that I happened to wander into uh, was Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg launching the Task Force on Climate Related F Financial Disclosures. And one of the things that uh, really grabbed my attention in that session was when uh, Mark Carney said that in their assessment, there were literally trillions of dollars uh, of unquantified, undisclosed, and therefore unmanaged risk sitting on corporate balance sheets relating to climate change around the world. Uh, and of course, that is a material risk uh, to the uh, to those companies uh, and should therefore be of interest to directors, shareholders, uh, fund managers, investors, and so on. Um, but also because everybody's intertwined these days, uh, it's also a material risk to the financial system itself. Uh, and so this thought gnawed away at me just long enough for me to get into government uh, a couple of years later. Um, and uh, we um, went and consulted the private sector and said, look, if we were to introduce a system of uh, climate-related financial disclosures, what would that look like? Uh, and uh, astonishingly, 86% um, of the private sector respondents came back and said, uh, we would like a mandatory reporting regime. Uh, so we would... I mean, this is kind of unusual for the financial sector uh, to say, but they said, we actually want more regulation. We want more reporting obligations on this, and we want everybody to be subject to it. Uh, because at the moment, we're aware that this risk exists, but if we report on it and our competitors don't, that's an uneven playing field. So we're actually disincentivized, disincentivized from, you know, from being transparent with our own investors and our own uh, shareholders. Uh, and owners um, about the scale of risk that, that they are exposed to. Um, and so we introduced uh, earlier this year legislation uh, and passed it uh, through its third reading about two weeks before COP26 started. And I'm delighted uh, because I think we are the first country in the world to uh, legislate for a mandatory reporting regime on climate-related financial disclosures. Now, there are companies uh, in uh, Aotearoa who are um, ahead of the game, uh, and uh, one of them will be uh, speaking this morning, so I don't want to steal his thunder, uh, but I did want to mention Westpac, uh, which is, you know, obviously large Australian-based bank, who are one of the largest banks in the New Zealand market as well. In advance of the legislation came, coming in, they did their own uh, TCFD, or Climate Related Financial Disclosures, report, uh, and one of the things that they uh, found there was that about 2% of their mortgage book is uh, exposed to uh, a reasonably high level of um, climate related risk, uh, particularly in the form of, um, you know, those properties becoming exposed to sea level rise, flood risk, uh, and so on. Um, and when you kind of go 2% doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but when you extrapolate that out in terms of the value of those properties, it's a lot of money. Uh, and of course, uh, the owners of those properties may be worried that 
uh, you know, they won't become, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll see insurance retreat and so on well before they see the actual physical risk uh, exposed uh, on their property and so on as well. So it's starting to reveal things that the companies didn't know about before, which of, of, of course gives them options for how to manage down uh, that risk. It also means that they can then talk to uh, the people that they're involved with, right? So they can have those conversations with those property owners uh, and start to um, reduce the risk to that property owner, uh, not just for the sake of the bank, but for the sake of that property owner as well. And that has to be a good thing. So um, I'm a huge enthusiast for this. Uh, I think that um, uh, increasing transparency uh, really does benefit um, those who, uh, you know, are, are doing, these, doing these reports. I think that what you will see uh, as this becomes more widespread um, is you will see risk at the very least be priced appropriately. That's so that so there are there'll be asset classes that you know people will still want to invest in, um, but they will be seen as higher risk and therefore will it attack you know a, a premium on on their kind of risk um, pricing. But there will be cases where businesses struggle to get access to capital, uh, and an early sign of this uh, was there the, uh, a mine a coal mining company uh, that. It wanted to open a bank account in New Zealand and could not get a current account uh, with a New Zealand bank. They, they just couldn't, they just wouldn't be banked. Um, and that obviously sends a signal uh, to that company uh, and to others in that asset class that actually the financial institutions are just saying, well, look, the days of coal, I mean, people are still using coal, obviously, but now is not the time to be investing in new coal assets uh, or, or exploring for, for uh, new reserves of coal and so on. Um, and so you're seeing that kind of behavior uh, start, to, um, start to change. The other thing I just wanted to mention about it uh, is that whilst in the regime that we've brought in, it actually only applies to a couple of hundred businesses because they are our largest um, asset managers and financial institutions and our largest listed companies uh, on our stock exchange. Um, but because uh, businesses, when they report, look at their scope three emissions, not just their scope one and two emissions, they are essentially looking at the whole value chain. Uh, and so there will be thousands of uh, small and medium enterprises um, who uh, whose information will essentially become part of this. And again, that enables uh, those uh, financial institutions or those large listed companies to be talking to their suppliers and to their customers and to be saying, uh, hey, did you know <laughs> that there is a level of risk here that you may be exposed to uh, and can we work together to, to reduce the profile of it? So it's one of those uh, very kind of niche, geeky uh, pieces uh, of regulation that no one really in the kind of broader world uh, is in the slightest bit interested in, um, but will probably be one of the things that I think has um, the single greatest effect uh, on uh, our economy uh, over the course of the coming years. And that will really help us to um, both reduce risk, but really to decarbonize the economy uh, in a pretty rapid period of time. Thank you. Thank you, James. And uh, I you know I know you talk about this being niche and, and really geeky, but, you know, I, I've got the scars of going around the world for the last 11 years trying to get this to be talked about and into regulation. And you'll find there's more and more of these geeks popping out of the woodwork. And that is a really, really good thing. Can I just say, so yeah. we've done a few, um, you know, seminars and workshops on this. I did a Zoom call uh, for the New Zealand market you know, at the time that the legislation was passing, just to kind of talk through what had changed since we first introduced into Parliament. And we had 600 people, and I don't think I'd had a, a 600 person business seminar in as long as I could remember. So it's niche, but it's a pretty active niche. Yeah, it's getting a lot, a lot of interest globally. And then, you know, I, I'm no longer sleeping because of that. So let's have a, have a now maybe turn across to Brazil, to Roberto Campos Nito, to have a look about how they've gone about doing this at the Brazilian Central Bank and their approach to implementing mandatory climate related financial disclosures for the institutions. And they'll do that in 2022. Good morning. First, I would like to thank New Zealand for the invitation to participate in this panel with such distinguished speakers. In my remarks, I will explain 
the more relevant elements of the Central Bank of Brazil experience on social, environmental, and sustainability issues. In particular, those related to social, environmental, and climate risk disclosure by financial institutions. Climate and environmental issues, which have long been major topics on the international agenda, have gained even more importance after the pandemic. Within climate risks, both physical and transition risks represent significant challenges going forward. To deal with these challenges, central banks need to remain on the frontier of knowledge and actions, responding to evolution of society's demand, structural changes in the economy, and to current and future shocks and risks. For central banks, having a sustainability agenda is important because sustainability issues have the potential to affect the two main mandates, monetary policy and financial stability. The Central Bank of Brazil has a long history of supporting the environmental agenda, implementing measures related to the subject and actively participating in the international debate. Especially in the last decade, the Central Bank of Brazil issued several regulations within the aim of starting the integration of social and environmental factors in the risk analysis of financial institutions. This sustainability agenda has several kinds of actions, internal initiatives, policies, partnerships, supervisory, and regulatory. Given the topic of this panel, I will focus on the point of our agenda related to mandatory social, environmental, and climate risk disclosure by financial institutions. Disclosure is a key element for market discipline, but it's the last step of a challenge transformation on the internal process of financial institutions with regard to risk management. All improvements on social, environmental, and climate-related risk management regulations are directly linked to the mandatory disclosure requirements, a feature that is essential for achieving consistency and comparability among a range of institutions with different sizes and complexity. In the Central Bank of Brazil Sustainability Agenda, the mandatory disclosure requirements are part of a broad regulatory environment to the current social environmental risk management regulation. In this process, the Central Bank of Brazil has sought to dialogue with society. For this, the Central Bank of Brazil has made use of public consultations to receive contributions for all segments of society on these issues. In the case of disclosure requirements, the Central Bank of Brazil has looked for implementation of a transparent and standardized reporting following international best practice, which include TCFD recommendations on climate, but also include a broader scope with social and environmental elements. Disclosure requirements on social, environmental, and climate-related risks are based on the four core elements of TCFD recommendations, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. Due to the complexity of climate-related issues, the Central Bank of Brazil decided to incorporate these recommendations in the prudential regulation in a gradual way, in two phases. Phase one, established in September 2021, which addresses qualitative aspects related to governance, strategy, and risk management. And phase two, expected to be concluded in 2022, will address quantitative aspects like metrics and targets. The regulation includes the following disclosure requirements. Management of social environment and climate-related risks, considering the governance of risk management and the strategies undertaken by the institutions in different time horizons, indicators used in the management of social, environmental, and climate-related risks, and business opportunities associated with social, environmental, and climate-related issues. Building on the experience of pillar three standards in the Basel framework, information is required to be disclosure in a standardized social, environmental, and climate risk and opportunity report consisting of templates that focus on each of the core elements in TCFD recommendations. This approach is useful for achieving consistency and comparability among different institutions. The new rules define mandatory templates for disclosure information regarding governance of risk management strategies and management of social environmental and climate-related risks in both dimensions of transition and physical risks. Disclosure of quantitative indicators and business opportunities associated with social, environmental, and climate-related issues is optional in the first phase. This choice has the objective to recognize the financial sector's advance in the use of these indicators and the identification of these opportunities. The new regulation follows principle of proportionality that consider the institutional size 
and risk profile, and we will apply to larger institutions, segments S1, S2, S3, and S4. Smaller institutions will be exempted from disclosure aligned with Pillar 3 requirements, considering the compliance cost of smaller institutions with a simplified risk profile. Financial institutions are expected to be publishing these reports annually by no later than June 2023, with information based up to December 2022. So far, the feedback and responses of financial institutions affected by the regulation were positive. We expect that with this mandatory disclosure regulation, the financial system can lead by example and stimulate non-financial firms, which are their counterparties, to also engage in disclosure of the social, environmental, and climate risks and opportunities in a transparent way. We have numerous examples that this is already happening in several non-financial companies on a voluntary basis. Finally, I would like to point out that the objective of the Central Bank of Brazil measures on mandatory disclosure and the other initiatives of the sustainability agenda is, within our mandate, to induce the conditions for the development of sustainable finance in the national financial system, which includes the best international practice related to sustainable finance, greater availability of financial system resources for sustainable enterprises, and better management of social, environmental, and climate risks. This set of measures is extensive, but by no means exhaustive. The plan is to stay on the frontier to address present and future social, environmental, and climate challenges, as this is a field in constant evolution. Thank you. Wow, that's a big announcement out of Brazil, isn't it? All ears. We were talking about this beforehand, weren't we, James? And, you know, how far do you go? Or, you know, climate, environmental, social, how do we bring that right in? And that's a really ambitious, you know, step that Brazil's taking. And I'd be really interested to watch how that starts to play out and how they go about enforcing that. But the holistic nature of the mm. conversation, I think, is a really important one. Mm. I, no, I agree. I mean, if you, if you I mean... I'm quite pleased about what we're doing, but New Zealand is frankly a very small economy uh, and um, Brazil is not, right? Brazil mm. is one of the largest economies in the world and uh, the number of companies in that kind of senior mm. class, I think, uh, is very significant uh, and, and uh, it'll be fascinating to see how that unfolds. I yeah. agree. I completely agree. Let's see. Now let's land across to Sasha Sadan, who's the Director of Environmental and Social and Governance of the UK's Financial Conduct Authority. It'd be great to get his thoughts on uh, the implementation of TCFD and their experience from a UK perspective. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think I'm waiting for my video to be turned on. Um, although I have a wonderful face for radio, it'd be nice if the, the host will allow me to have the video. Yes, Sasha. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I apologise. I'm, I'm here and very excited. I might just start until they get the video sorted. But um, look... This is so important. I have been an asset manager, one of the largest asset managers for a tr trillion dollars of money. And I moved over to be the regulator of the UK financial markets, the Financial Conduct Authority. And therefore, I think this is extremely important. And I've seen how this works. I absolutely passionately care about this. And it's great to hear James and Roberto Mardi talk about this. I hope you can still hear me, so I'll carry on. And apologies for not seeing me. Um, I just came back from Glasgow, and it was absolutely superb to talk to people about this. What are we doing? The most important thing is we also have made TCFD a very important part of our metrics, and we're already disclosing Stop. everywhere. Most importantly, and I think this is something really important, we will be going to mandatory disclosure on TCFD. And we are consulting on that, and hopefully it will be started from 2022 reporting stage. So we also agree, it's one of the largest financial markets. We think this is extremely important. But concurrently, and really important, and Mardi knows this, the ISSB, which we very much helped and wanted to support massively yeah, yeah. so that we can have one standard, is really yeah, important. Yeah. And I think that is something that I am passionately caring about. We know that if we have the ISSB and the metrics, then that helps us all have one standard um, set of metrics. Very important. I can't emphasize how important that is. And it's not just climate, that's sustainability metrics. Secondly, we will then use that because we're going to mandate TCFD, not just for listed equities, 
not just for standard listed equities, we will be doing this for asset managers, pension funds, and insurance companies. So we will be widening this brief and making this more than comply or explain. So I think that is extremely important. One of the things that our Chancellor announced on Wednesday, which was really important last Wednesday at Glasgow, was that we also want very good net zero transition plans. And I know that we're going there with TCFD, it goes some of the way, but we need to go further. So we announced on Wednesday that we would be one of the first or the first country to want detailed net zero transition plans further than TCFD. And we've arranged a working group of some of the experts internationally, because we don't want this to be parochial, internationally to make sure that we can have standards of net zero. I am I do not want to hear a net zero plan in 2050. I want to know what the net zero transition is in 2025. I want to know if it's linked to someone's pay. I want to know if they're on target, if they're missing their targets, what they're going to do. And those are the sorts of things that we're all going to need in every country. So we'll get that working group. It's coming very soon. And we will then mandate those transition plans quite quickly. We will do this quite quickly. Our Chancellor has said it. And we as the regulator will put that into practice. So those are two of the big areas that we are focusing on. And thirdly, labelling. I, I know this is slightly different, but we have a lot of issues on greenwashing. And I do think that's an area that we also have to focus on. And therefore, we are making sure we just come out with a paper on what kind of labelling we want. We're using the work that's already been done around the world. We're using some of the taxonomies, but we will absolutely next year put labels on all products that are authorised in the country to make sure that they are linked to what they say they do. And if they're not, then that's where the enforcement regime of the FCA comes into play. And I know, Mardi, it's something very important that we talked about before. We must make sure that greenwashing doesn't affect too much, because if we lose the trust of the industry, we won't get the products. And if we don't get the products and we don't get the innovation, the finance won't move. And if it doesn't move, we won't get anywhere near these targets for this so important topic. So apologies for not being on video, but hopefully you got my punchiness, my enthusiasm and what we're trying to do. Absolutely, Sasha. And I, I actually feel privileged to be on a panel where people have just as much energy and excitement for this topic as I do. I've never in my entire career had so many people so passionate, so excited, and so many people wanting to take so much action and really do good work on this topic. So I think this will go down in history. You know, this panel today is being really progressive. You mentioned it, you mentioned enforcement, you mentioned the labeling, Sasha, yeah. you mentioned uh, the move across. Is that how you plan on getting the high quality disclosure, or do you have other means that you plan on putting out? Is this like a real enforcement you know really coming down hard on enforcement is that your strategy so the answer is, is a bit of everything so we, we really can't wait for issb to come into practice but we can't wait we can't even wait for tcfd to be as perfect as it can be but the new transition guidance from tcfd is better but at the same time already listed companies we regulate they are putting out in their annual disclosures let's let's be be honest annual reports there are a few annual reports out there that say some of them say they're climate leaders well, we've just been writing to them saying, well, how does that, where is it material risk? Where is it in your annual report? What metrics are you measuring that? And if it is such a most important topic, why isn't pay linked to it? Now, as we get more metrics and as the world starts getting this in more consistent standard, and thank you, Mardi, for the ISSB and all the work you've done, we can then have more metrics that hopefully the asset managers who own those companies on behalf of asset owners can also challenge that. But we wrote a letter, I've even got it in front of me here, to a certain FTSE 100 company, I won't mention it because I don't want to embarrass them yet, but said, <laughs> you may have been breaching material rules already because of the statements that you've made without any metrics to back that up. Now, at the moment, it's parochial. It's very early. But as we get that system in place and as we get the data, we can use that much more. We also work with the audit community and we want to make sure that the auditors, if they are going to look at it, and you know, you know what the answer is, Mardi, at the moment, the back has numbers and the front has nice words. We need to make sure that the front, if they make statements, they are assured. And that's something as an international community we've got to make sure of. 
I, I couldn't agree more, Sasha. And it's like you've been reading my speaking notes for the last couple of months, actually. So you and I are very, very well aligned. And for the community that have joined us today that don't know what the ISSB is, it is the International Sustainability Standards Board, which was launched uh, last Wednesday here at COP by Mark Carney and Erki Lethkainen um, of the International Financial Reporting Standards Board. And the, the announcement was that the, the people that have been setting our accounting standards for all of these years are now coming together to set global sustainability standards, which will be built on off the floor of the TCFD and work of organizations like CDSB and SASB, um, you know, and, and IR and uh, many others are, over the last few years. So, you know, if we look tired, it's because, you know, that wasn't easy to pull off, but I assure you the product will be worthwhile in terms of a consistency and, and something that really can be audited and regulated and held to account. So we've heard from the regulators, we've heard from the policymakers, it's now time to hear from business. Ma, I'm uh, sorry, David Benatar from Hi. Chief, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Warehouse Group. Yes. So you've, your minister's given you uh, given you mandatory TCFD reporting. What was your reaction to the to the announcement? What opportunities do you see, and how are you getting ready? So first, I love the energy, and I tell you where the business finds its energy in the streets with our customers. So on Saturday, I decided to skip the conference and I went to the protest, and I saw more than a hundred thousand people asking for more actions, more ambition, ambitious actions, and real action. So. TCFD is probably providing that linkage between the market and what corporate is doing and reporting on. So we welcome the format because everybody has been asking for what is the right way to report on our performance and how can you help us decide on where to fo focus our efforts. So the way we prepared for TCFD is first by disclosing our activity following the integrated report, which we've been doing for a few years. And in addition to the integrated report format, we added the GRI reporting last year. All of that is adding, is helping us build the um, governance and capabilities to equip ourselves for climate risk in the organization. I love that we already went from TCFD to other social related risk. And you can see already the complexity of the topic. So any new way to form a baseline so that analysts, employees, and obviously our customers can compare apple to apple, the type of action and resources that business is putting to prepare for climate risk is really welcome. But again, loop it back to the market, loop it back to our customers and see the behavior change that we start to see happening at pace. Overall, I would say thank you for the uh, making it mandatory. Mm -hmm. That's welcome. I always say you're making my job easier inside the corporate world. And I don't think I'm the only one to say that. So what have the challenges been for you as a business in sort of now thinking about this as a mandatory and, and having to uh, respond to that? Yeah, so the, the challenges are really about building the um, both the technical expertise, dedicating the time to focusing on the issue, and understanding that dealing with climate and climate risk is going to become business as usual. So you need to have every echelon of the organization, from the board to the leadership to the employees, really integrate climate, um, climate impact and climate drivers into everything we do. We are between suppliers on one hand and customers on the other. That's where we sit, retailers. So we have global supply chain, Bangladesh, India, and China. And then we have a large customer market all through the country in New Zealand. Our role is to understand, manage, and mitigate the risk on both ends. It's not a small task. <laughs> It requires extensive data that we are that is difficult to source, but we are there, and that's our mandate, and that's our purpose. So anything that can help us accelerate these uh, these areas of focus is welcome again. So, Minister Shaw, New Zealand has gone down the same route as some other countries on uh, mandatory reporting. What do you say to other jurisdictions that haven't taken the bold, ambitious leadership that you have? Uh, look, it's not it's not going to surprise you to learn. Uh, I would just say, get on board, um, get with the program. Uh, I mean, we we had an internal debate in New Zealand because we're a small economy, um, we're at the very uh, end of a of a long supply chain, uh, and you know we, we're a heavily trade 
uh, oriented uh, economy. Um, our financial markets are primarily Australia's financial markets, but you know, obviously, we you know our capital comes from all over the world, and so there was quite a big debate about what are the implications of us having a mandatory re reporting regime um, for our um, asset managers and and financial institutions and so on that other regimes that we were you know, that we're essentially our economy is tied into uh, if they if they don't. Um, and, it, you know, essentially we know that this is coming. You, you know, you heard before about how the UK is moving down there. We're, you know, we've actually just signed a trade deal or we are about to sign a trade deal with the United Kingdom. Uh, so these kinds of things will become more and more uh, integrated. Um, and uh, I know, I think at last count, there's something like 63 central banks uh, around the world that are um, uh, working on some form of um, regime because they're worried about the uh, level of risk to the um, financial systems that they're responsible for. Uh, and so I would just say, look, this is something, you know, that, that business wants, um, that investors want, uh, that directors want, um, because ultimately it's actually about reducing risk and reducing risk profile. And if you go down the mandatory uh, regime, that reduces it the most because you're not then exposing individual companies um, by having this uneven playing field. And, you know, as David said, the apples for apples comparison is, is critical to that. So I would I'd just say, look, it's, it's, you know, it's time. Let's, let's get rolling. David, so what would you tell a company that hasn't got started on this journey? Sorry to put you on the spot. You know, you're a leader. Yeah. What do you tell those that haven't got started? Well, I would tell them it takes time to get ready. Mm -hmm. So start now because you will need that time to be ready for the time when the regulation makes it compulsory for you to report. Don't wait. Simple message. Don't get, don't, well, you've heard it here, ladies and gentlemen, get started. It's coming. Regulation is coming on a global basis. It's coming, you know, with a very high floor. TCFD is not, not a low floor. You know, I really think people need to get started and start thinking about what they've got. Now, there's a lot of tools out there to help you. This isn't, you know, this isn't like jumping in blind. Uh, the task force on climate related financial disclosures, how, we have a knowledge hub and CDSB, we power that in our spare time. On there, there is a stack of really useful resources, everything from like, how do I get started, like a checklist, like, you know, look what I've got internally, talk to the account on internal controls, look at my, you know, really simple, practical, get started, free tools to help you do that. There's also a series of e-learning courses that are also free and CPD accredited. They've had over 10,000 completions globally. I think we had a goal of 800. I mean, this is insane. The demand for access to, to learning and development in this space Particularly, and we thought, we thought, oh, well, we had no idea. It's, it's coming from everyone from CFOs right down to entry area sustainability professionals completing mm -hmm. these courses. And they're on governance strategies, scenarios. And we link then across to things like water and biodiversity as well, really to help move this into a more of a holistic space. And, and with that, we now have briefing, you know, best practice handbooks. What does, okay, I shouldn't say best good practice looks like where improvements can be made. There are also tools out there on what net zero should look like. You know, net zero is all we've heard from Sasha, a lot of commitments. What does that actually look like in the numbers in the back of your report? If you said you're net zero, we've got guidance on things like that. We've also got a climate risk card game that was launched last week. You can literally download it and play it with your colleagues. You know, the ones that don't get it, you know, the ones where you want to bridge the department, you can watch your share price go up and down. You can watch yourself go bankrupt based on your decisions. You can have, you know, a mean CEO and a progressive CFO together having, you know, and you give people roles, obviously, but you can see what that does to the business and the prices and the way it moves forward. It's a delight to open up. You can download it. It's fully downloadable. If you manage to catch me, you might be able to get a copy here at COP or from us, but it's downloaded, print it out, play it with, play with everyone, your family, your friends, you know, these are really important issues and we all have to think about, you know, new ways of having the conversations and tackling them together. I think we are at time, aren't we? Mardi, could I just quickly... Do you, do you have any... We're, we're, like, flying through this today. Is there anything else you guys want? Because we're all so interested and passionate and excited. We can, like, literally nail the points on the head. I, I was just... You know, the idea of a, 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 card, a TCFD card game, I mean, that's my Saturday night sorted, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Mardi, if, if I could speak for... Really well, uh, I, I guess, ladies and gentlemen... Hi. It's been the most energizing panel I think I've ever sat on on TCFD in my entire career <laughs> and climate risk disclosure. So I urge you to share this with your friends, share this recording with your friends, share these wonderful messages with our friends. And I'd like to thank our good friends at the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, one for your leadership. I mean, truly. 
congratulations and well done. You know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really passionate about what you've done and I think it will make a big difference you know, globally. Thank you very much to our friends in Brazil and, and in, in, London, um, in London, the Financial Conduct Authority, Sasha. Again, your enthusiasm for this is uh, it's actually infectious and uh, I hope to meet you in person very, very soon. And David, keep up the good work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. much.